and welcome to our video, Food for the Moon, the Morphic Resonance of Gurdjieff's Teachings. Today we're going to compare some of the key ideas of George Gurdjieff's cosmology with the modern scientific theory of morphic resonance put forth by Dr. Rupert Sheldrake to explore the profound insights into the nature of human consciousness and the cosmic order. And the reason I want to talk about food for the moon is because it's one of the most complex and also misunderstood concepts in Gurdjieff's system. Because Gurdjieff's cosmology is so interconnected, in order to explain food for the moon and what he meant by that, you almost have to explain the entire system itself. And so that's what we're going to try to do here is to try to understand the system so that we can understand what food for the moon means. As well, we are going to turn to morphic resonance, which is another way that we can explain some of the complex interactions of the Gurdjieff system. So I'm going to give you a quick overview on Food for the Moon before I give you a quick overview of Morphic Resonance, and then we're going to do a deep dive of both. This is a complex chart, but the main thing you need to understand is that there is something called the Ray of Creation, which is the energy coming from the Absolute. And this Ray of Creation goes into the solar system it transforms in different ways and there's always the law of three so there's always three types of energies that are blending together and it descends down the chain until it gets to the end of the absolute so essentially in our solar system the energy comes from the sun it descends down to the planets it descends down into earth and then eventually ends up at the moon and the Earth is kind of a buffer between the planets and the moon. It's essentially a stopgap of sorts. Gurdjieff laid this out like a musical scale. So it goes do, re, mi, fa, so, li, la, ti, do. And kind of like there are different intervals, like half steps within an octave. This is what Gurdjieff would call the shock point. And organic life is that shock point for the galaxy. That means that the energy descending from the sun cannot reach the moon unless it is blended in with Earth's energy. And we are the growing branch. If you can imagine life as a tree, Earth is kind of the branch that is on that tree and it's growing. And our growth eventually will go to the moon. Our atmosphere will eventually reach the atmosphere of the moon because it's sucking it up like a big electromagnet. And that's one thing you need to take away from this chart is that all of these circles are essentially electromagnets and they all are pulling and merging with all the other electromagnets. And they form a group of holons, which is one field nested within another field like Russian nesting dolls. And this is very similar to morphic resonance. If you're not familiar with the idea of morphic resonance. It was a theory proposed by Dr. Rupert Sheldrake a couple of decades ago. And Dr. Sheldrake is a biologist by trade, although he does dabble in many different fields of science. And he was studying genetics and he noticed that there's a lot of information that passes on from cell to cell in the genetic data, but one thing that the data doesn't show is the information of how the cells know how to form in certain patterns. And that information is not found in the genes. What is found in the genes is different information of how the cell can make another cell, but it doesn't explain how the cells know how to group themselves into these different patterns. And biologists have been puzzled for this for a long time. And Dr. Sheldrake proposes that it's the, the idea of morphic resonance. In other words, some type of magnetic field or some type of quantum field that is passing on this information through the field itself, not through the material side, not through the genes, but actually some type of 
magnetic or quantum field is retaining some of this information and it's passing it down from field to field. And according to Dr. Sheldrake, all self-organizing systems are holes made out of parts, which are themselves holes at a lower level, such as atoms, molecules, and crystals. The same is true of cells and tissues, tissues and organs, organs and organisms, organisms and social groups. At each level, the morphic field gives each hole its characteristic properties and interconnects and coordinates the constituent parts. The fields responsible for the development and maintenance of bodily form in plants and animals are called morphogenic fields. So morphogenic fields are located within and around the systems they organize. Like quantum fields, they work probabilistically. They restrict or impose order on the inherent indeterminism of the systems under their influence. Dr. Sheldrake says that morphic resonance also sheds new light on many religious practices, including rituals. And that's an extremely salient point, as we'll see with Gurdjieff's rituals and spiritual practices in his fourth way methodology. The idea of morphic resonance really puts things in a new light when looking back at what Gurdjieff was trying to communicate. Because even though there was this grand outer cosmology, everything could be linked back to psychology, or in other words, to perceptual fields. Dr. Sheldrake says that perceptual fields are particular kinds of morphic fields. They extend beyond the brain into the environment because they link us to the objects of our perception, we are capable of affecting what we look at through our intention and attention. In addition to morphic fields, there's also something called Akashic fields, which is something hypothesized by a philosopher of science named Urban Laszlo. And he says this field of information is the substance of the cosmos. He calls this the information field or Akashic field. He posits that the quantum vacuum is actually the fundamental energy and information carrying field that informs not just the current universe, but all universes past and present. Laszlo believes that such an informational field can explain why our universe appears to be fine tuned so as to form galaxies and conscious life forms and why evolution is an informed, not random process. He believes that this hypothesis solves several problems that emerged from quantum physics especially non-locality and quantum entanglement. So this just gives you an idea of how these morphic fields work on the quantum level. And there are all these fields that are nested within one another, but constantly merging with each other, going out and coming back and creating underlying field of information and memory. You can visualize this by thinking of waves on a beach, how the water rolls in and it rolls out and it rolls back into itself. And it's constantly mixing back and forth and the molecules are getting all mixed up while the waves are going back and forth. And it's also analogous to thermodynamic entropy and physics, which measures disorder or randomness in a physical system. Also, the act of organizing or transmitting information can be associated with changes in entropy involving energy. And the way that quantum bits store information in quantum computers, for example, exhibit behaviors that directly link the concepts of information and energy. Also, the manipulation of information cannot occur without energetic transactions. So there's a lot of interplay between these fields of information and energy. Several intriguing phenomena offer compelling evidence for the existence of morphic fields. Take, for instance, the experiments where rats learned to navigate mazes. Remarkably, not only did the offspring of these rats show improved performance, but unrelated rats worldwide also showed enhancements in maze-solving abilities. This global improvement suggests the operation of a morphic field or collective unconscious, distributing knowledge beyond genetic connections. Another fascinating observation is the gradual improvement of humans in IQ tests. This isn't necessarily because humans are becoming inherently smarter, but rather it seems the repeated taking of these tests has embedded the knowledge into a morphic field, enhancing performance across the board. Rupert Sheldrake proposes that morphic resonance acts as a memory system, transferring information across fields, suggesting that our thoughts and memories might not be confined to our brains, but reside within this shared field. 
Moreover, there have been studies showing that dogs can anticipate their owner's arrival home, and individuals can sense when they're being stared at, even when their eyes closed. These phenomena could be attributed to a sensory field we're all connected to, capable of transmitting feelings and intentions beyond our physical senses. Another thing that could be explained by morphic fields is Alzheimer's, which of course is a memory disease, and one of the theories of morphic resonance is that memory is not actually stored in the brain, but it's stored in the morphic field. And our brains essentially are part of the mind, but the mind is actually outside of the brain and so are the memories. In Alzheimer patients, they've discovered a larger amount than normal of certain minerals such as copper, iron, and a magnetic material called magnonite. And if the mind field, the morphic field, if you will, is some type of electromagnetic field, then perhaps these metals and magnets in the brain are somehow jamming the memories from getting through, and that could potentially explain Alzheimer's as well. And this has actually been theorized by other scientists that perhaps the brain is not the source, perhaps it is more akin to a antenna on a radio that allows us to tune in to the frequency. For example, the filter or transmission theory of consciousness put forth by William James and supported by philosophers like David Chalmers essentially says that the brain is more of a filtering capacity for consciousness than the source of consciousness. The theory posits that consciousness is actually the base state of reality and the brain's job is to filter out consciousness and narrow it down to a more personalized view. A lot of Jungian psychoanalysts have taken an interest in the theory of morphic resonance lately because they think that it explains the collective unconscious, how the different archetypes and memories of the past can continue to express themselves in the culture because there's always this knowledge being passed along generation to generation from the different archetypes in the collective unconscious. And there's an interesting juxtaposition of Jung's collective unconscious and Gurdjieff's theories, and they reveal a multidimensional understanding of, of existence where psychology, cosmology, and field theory converge. And Gurdjieff and Jung did live around the same time period, and they knew of each other, but it's not reported that they ever met. But there was a lot of synergy in their psychology, and one of Jung's closest pupils and colleagues in the early 1900s was someone named Maurice Nichol, who was a psychiatrist and neurologist, ran a very successful medical practice, and was very close friends with Young, close enough that he made Young his daughter's godfather. And in 1919, while Young was visiting Nichol in London, Young shared a dream in which he and Nichol both labored at clipping the same tree. But Nichol worked at a higher level than Young, and Young could not understand. Nichol interpreted this tree to represent psychology, the area in which they both worked in. And soon Nichol would discover and commit to another psychological system he considered more complete than Young's. Nichol at the time, this was around 1920, was disillusioned. He ran a very successful medical practices, was one of the top psychoanalysts in the world but still he felt that something was missing, like there was something he didn't understand. And so in 1921, he composed a prayer to Hermes, who is the Egyptian god of wisdom. And he wrote in his journal to Hermes, teach me, instruct me, show me the path that I may know certainly, help my great ignorance, illumine my darkness. And it seems his question was answered because a few months later he met someone named P.D. Ospensky and they had a lot in common in terms of their psychology and scientific interests. 
And Ospitsky invited him to hear a lecture by someone named George Gurdjieff. And they went off together to see the lecture. It was about an hour long. And afterwards, Nicole knew immediately that this was now the direction his life was going to go. He had found the answer to his prayer and what he had been looking for, which is a higher level of psychology. And Nicole would go on to be quite the fourth way teacher and write several commentaries on the work, as they call it. And here's what Nicole said when he discovered Gurdjieff's system. When I committed to the work, I had already studied at different times in the past, the Gnostic literature, the Neoplatonist, the Alchemist, some of the Indian scriptures, the Hermetic writers, the Sufi literature, the Bible, the Chinese mystics, the writings of Meister Eckhart, Bomi, Blake, Swedenberg, and others, and had been a pupil of Jung for some years. But it did not mean that my previous studies had been useless. They now enabled me to see how strong and clear and connected the work was by comparison. What I had to do now was to study the ideas and the methods of the work. Anything useful gained from the past would then fall into its place. So Nicol meets Gurdjieff and Ospensky, and a few months later, he closes his very successful medical practice and moves to France from London. And he joins Gurdjieff's Institute for the Harmonic Development of Man. A few years later, he is requested by Ospinsky to start his own fourth way study group where he wrote several commentaries outlining the psychology of the practice. One thing that attracted Nicole to Ospinsky and Gurdjieff's system was that at its core, it was a psychological method, meaning it was not just theorizing, but it had a practical application that could be followed. This made it different from other spiritual cosmologies, such as theosophy, which had a lot of theories, but not as much practical value and practice. The fourth way incorporated the hermetic concept of as above or so below, or that the outside world mirrors the inside world, and that the goal of the method was to unite the inner and outer worlds into a unified state. So the teaching about cosmology could be applied to the work on the inside, you know, the work on the inside could be compared to the cosmology or the work on the outside. In other words, learning about one teaches you about the other. That's because we are mirrors of the cosmos in which we live. And we can compare this to morphic resonance in several ways. For example, Rupert Sheldrake said that all self-organizing systems are holes made up of parts which are themselves holes at a lower level, such as atoms in molecules and molecules in crystals, and also organisms in social groups. And this is very similar to how Gurdjieff divided not just the human, but also the cosmos. So the human could be divided into different centers, which he called the mind, the body, and the emotional centers. And the universe as well could be divided, all going from the highest absolute all the way down to the lowest absolute. Or in other words, from the sun to the moon. And this is where food for the moon comes in. Gurdjieff's cosmological teachings describe a hierarchical cosmos where the pure light of consciousness descends into matter and then descends back towards consciousness creating a spectrum of materiality and consciousness states. This is conceptualized as a ray of creation, where each level is a whole entity, a whole on, that contains all the levels be below it, akin to a set of nested Russian dolls. This model posits a universe where everything is infused with an animating intelligence that bridges matter and consciousness. This is similar to morphic resonance because each level of morphic resonance contains levels that are above and below it. What we're really talking about here is the transformation of energy into higher or lower states. And you can think about this in practical terms. For example, take how solar panels work. 
they take the energy from the sun, which is a very high level of energy, and they take that energy and they transform it into electricity, which is a lower form of energy. And then that electricity is used, let's say it's used by a computer that will give off heat, which is another form of energy. So you go from the sun to electricity to heat, and then you can again transform that energy into higher levels. So let's say the heat goes into the air, it creates wind for a windmill to turn, that turns that energy into electricity again, and then that electricity, let's say, gets used to power a laser, which is a very fine, high form of energy. So we have the same ability in our organism as humans as well. So we take in food that powers our bodies and this transforms it into a higher energy and some of that energy will dissipate into heat but some of that energy will be transformed in our bodies to give us mental energy and in Gurdjieff's cosmology we can take that energy and utilize it for alchemy he saw the body as an alchemical factory whose job is to create finer and finer energies we take in various energies, for, for example, food, we take in oxygen, and we also take in impressions. He thought impressions were the third type of food. So we take impressions and oxygen and food from the environment, and the body will transform those into higher forces, but it can only function if the organism is functioning correctly. Otherwise, it will not produce the energy that it's supposed to produce, it will top out at a certain point and will not be able to produce the very fine energies that someone at a high level of consciousness is able to produce. And one thing about morphic fields is that all morphic fields contain what are called attractors. And attractors are the endpoints toward which a system tends to follow. And they're a scientific way of thinking about ends, purposes, goals, or intentions. And in Gurdjieff's cosmology, the moon is an attractor. It's like a giant electromagnet attracting the essence of life from Earth's organic beings. This process is imagined like an ethereal connection, like a umbilical cord between mother and child, channeling vital energy from the earth to the moon. In human terms, the moon's influence is akin to an unseen force guiding our automatic behaviors. The extent of the moon's control over us correlates with our level of automatic action and lack of authentic existence. So essentially the moon is guiding all of the energy, drawing energy from humans. But the purpose of man in Gurdjieff's view is not to become food for the moon, meaning not to give all of our life energy to the moon, but to also transform the energy into higher state of energy to push the energy back up the chain, back towards the absolute. And his idea was that man had a magnetic field around himself and that this magnetic field interacted with other fields including the fields of other people as well as the magnetic fields of the moon and other planets and the sun and Gurdjieff developed this diagram of what he called the magnetic center and the magnetic center was a very important part of Gurdjieff and Ospensky's work Ospensky actually later would create his own fourth way group and he would specifically look for people who had developed their magnetic center to a certain point because it was at this point that his teachings could actually work for them. And so to explain a little bit more about this magnetic center, I'll show you this diagram here and you can see that this V, which is the large circle, represents life in its totality. And you have these different influences, A and B. 
So A are the influences created in life. So these are the more mechanical influences. These would be influences that would come from the moon, the lower influences. And in the theory of morphic influence, these influences can be described as similar to the laws of nature, or as Dr. Sheldrake calls them, the habits of nature, because he doesn't believe that there are universal laws per se, but that when something happens in nature, it becomes a memory or a habit, and that thing is more likely to happen again. And so you can think of these fields out there composed of information and memory and connected to us and influencing us to repeat these same patterns over and over again. And these are the lower influences. Type B influences are created outside of life, but thrown into the general vortex of life. So what that means is Essentially, you have influences that are created from a higher place, something that's connected to the ray of creation or something that is vibrating at a higher frequency. And these influences can also become habitual because they're thrown into the vortex of life. But they can also be utilized to transform oneself and one's magnetic center to receive more and more of these influences and less and less of the other influences. And that raises the vibration of your personal magnetic center. According to Gertz, if there was another type of influence, which is the influence of H1, and you can see this type of person is connected to something called the esoteric center, and that's the circle E there. And according to Gurdjieff, these are the highest types of influences one can receive, higher than type B, because type B influences, while they come from a higher place, they're thrown into the general vortex of life. Whereas the influences from type H are coming directly at you. They're not being filtered. They're not being thrown into the vortex of life. They're being radiated directly from a higher person. So you can imagine if the other type of influence was coming from the moon, this type of influence would be coming from the sun. So it is a higher type of magnetic influence. And the more you work on yourself, the more you will be able to attract the right kind of influences and repel the wrong kind of influences. And that's called developing your magnetic center. And Gurdjieff called this, in another allegory, the two streams metaphor. So he mentions that there's one stream that is heading towards the moon or it's heading towards death. And there's another stream that's heading towards life. And we're all caught up when we're born in the stream that is heading towards death. But with some work and some effort and the right types of influences, someone can make the jump from one stream to the other stream. And that's the stream where your magnetic center is developed and it's attracting the right kind of influences. And not only is it attracting the right kind of influences, but it also gives one a degree of free will to be able to withstand the temptation to fall into habitual patterns and influences that may be bad for us. And it's transforming the energy into a higher form of energy. Now, what do I mean by a higher form of energy? Well, much like we gave the analogy earlier of the body being an alchemical factory whose job it is to produce finer energies, humanity's role is also to produce higher energies for the sake of the rest of the universe as well, including the moon. And in Beelzebub's tales, Gurdjieff presents the idea that human awakening generates this energy that nourishes the moon. And it suggests that the universe derives specific energies from us through various means. This concept underlies the necessity for the transmutation of energy to fulfill the universe demands. But should a portion of humanity fail to transmute this energy consciously, the universe compensates through other means. Gurdjieff explains, 
great nature was constrained to adapt herself to extract the sacred substance by other means, one of which is precisely that periodic terrifying process there of reciprocal destruction. So Gurdjieff is interpreting that wars and calamities are manifestations of cosmic forces due to nature's energy requirements. But this perspective is not solely cosmological. It has personal and psychological dimensions as well. On an individual level, to feed the moon in a negative manner means life extracting what it needs from you while you remain unaware and subjugated, being depleted of your energy. Yet there exists a choice to awaken and liberate oneself from the moon's grasp thereby producing a superior form of energy that not only satisfies the cosmic demand, but also emancipates you from lunar and planetary influences. And another segment of Gurdjieff that I'd like to quote, and he gives another idea of what food for the moon ultimately means. On another occasion, G explained the idea of moon from a wholly new direction. Up till now, we have talked about the moon as the growing branch of the cosmos at the end or destination of the ray of creation, which originates in the absolute. There is another level at which you must understand this idea. Given that man is the microcosm that replicates all that exists in the cosmos, this line from the absolute to the moon also exists in man. The representative of the absolute in man is full consciousness, about which our knowledge is incomplete. We do know, however, that the effort to free oneself from identification creates a corresponding amount of free attention. This presence of free attention in man is a second-order representative of the absolute. It is a foretaste of what he might eventually come to know as full consciousness. The moon in man is sensation. It is that broken part of the original consciousness of man, and it is that part toward which a man who wishes to work has a primary responsibility. For sensation in man is the growing part of his inner cosmos. The ray of creation inside man extends from free attention to sensation. What Gurdjieff is saying here is that to evolve consciously is to unite the free attention that is the higher consciousness with the lower, which is the sensation in the body. Or as psychoanalysts would say, uniting the conscious with the unconscious or the subconscious. What I think Gurdjieff is ultimately doing here is giving both the framework and a methodology to psychologically integrate one's morphic fields and unite them thus creating a unified magnetic center that has a degree of free will and is not pulled apart by the different influences outside of itself. To compare this to morphic resonance, one of the key properties of a morphic field, according to Dr. Sheldrake, is that they attract the systems under their influence towards characteristic forms and patterns of activity. So like attracts like. So by developing a magnetic center that is of a certain type, it will attract another morphic field of a certain type as well. And also another thing about the morphic fields that are interesting is they contain a built-in memory. This memory is cumulative. The more often particular patterns of activities are repeated, the more habitual they tend to become. And this gets us talking about the laws of nature. Dr. Sheldrake, from his point of view, there is no reason to suppose that all the laws of nature spring into being fully formed at the moment of the Big Bang, or that they exist in a metaphysical realm beyond time and space. According to Sheldrake, cosmic laws are another way of saying cosmic habits. If we want to stick to the idea of natural laws, we could say that as nature itself evolves, the laws of nature also evolve, just as human laws evolve over time. Many kinds of organisms have habits, but only humans have laws. The habits of nature depend on non-local similarity reinforcement. So essentially what 
Sheldrake is saying is that the laws of nature aren't necessarily laws, they're habits. And that is very akin to what Gurdjieff would teach because he would agree that habits, in other words, unconscious actions, are exactly what we have to break if we want to be free of the moon's pull. And if we want to have our own individuality, our own will, what we need is to break the habits that have been inherited or learned by us so that we can attract better influences and create a finer energy. And one of the interesting things, if you look at this ray of creation, we have different laws for different layers of the nested hierarchy of patterns here. Let me just read something about what Gurdjieff thought of the laws and how to free yourself from the laws. On the earth, we are very far removed from the will of the absolute. We are separated from it by 48 orders of mechanical laws. If we could free ourselves from one half of those laws, we should find ourselves subject to only 24 orders of laws, that is, to the laws of the planetary world. And then we should be one stage nearer to the absolute and its will. If we could then free ourselves from one half of these laws, we should be subject to the laws of the sun, 12 laws, and consequently one stage nearer to the absolute. If again, we could free ourselves from half these laws, we should be subject to the laws of the starry world and separated by only one stage from the immediate will of the absolute and the possibility for man thus gradually to free himself from mechanical laws exists. The study of the 48 orders of laws to which man is subject cannot be abstract like the study of astronomy. They can be studied only by observing them in oneself and by getting free of them. At the beginning, a man must simply understand that he is quite needlessly subject to a thousand petty but irksome laws which have been created for him by other people and by himself. When he attempts to get free from them, he will see that he cannot. Long and persistent attempts to gain freedom from them will convince him of his slavery. The laws to which man is subject can only be studied by struggling with them, by trying to get free from them. But a great deal of knowledge is needed in order to become free from one law without creating for oneself another in its place. The orders of laws and their forms vary according to the point of view from which we consider the ray of creation. In our system, the end of the ray of creation, the growing end, so to speak, of the branch, is the moon. The energy for growth, that is, for the development of the moon, and for the formation of new shoots, goes to the moon from the earth, where it is created by the joint action of the sun, of all the other planets of the solar system, and of the earth itself. This energy is collected and preserved in a huge accumulator situated on the earth's surface, this accumulator is organic life on Earth. Organic life on Earth feeds the moon. Everything living on the Earth, people, animals, plants, is food for the moon. The moon is a huge living being feeding upon all that lives and grows on the Earth. The moon could not exist without organic life on Earth any more than organic life could exist without the moon. Moreover, in relation to organic life, the moon is a huge electromagnet. The process of growth and the warming of the moon is connected with life and death on the earth. Everything living sets free at its death a certain amount of the energy that has animated it. This energy, or the souls of everything living, plants, animals, people, is attracted to the moon as through a huge electromagnet. In the economy of the universe, nothing is lost. And a certain energy, having finished its work on one plane, goes to another. The souls that go to the moon, possessing perhaps even a certain amount of consciousness and memory, find themselves there under 96 laws in the condition of mineral life, or to put it differently, in conditions from which there is no escape apart from a general evolution in immeasurably long planetary cycles. The moon is at the extremity, at the end of the world, it is the outer darkness of the Christian doctrine where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
The influence of the moon upon everything living manifests itself in all that happens on the earth. The moon is the chief, or rather the nearest, the immediate, motive force of all that takes place in organic life on the earth. All movements, actions, and manifestation of people, animals, and plants depend on the moon and are controlled by the moon. The sensitive film of organic life which covers the earthly globe is dependent upon the influence of the huge electromagnet that is sucking out its vitality. Man, like every other living being, cannot, in the ordinary conditions of life, tear himself free from the moon. All his movements and consequently all his actions are controlled by the moon. If he kills another man, the moon does it. If he sacrifices himself for others, the moon does that also. All evil deeds, all crimes, all self-sacrificing actions, all heroic exploits, as well as the actions of ordinary everyday life are controlled by the moon. The liberation which comes with the growth of mental powers and faculties is liberation from the moon. The mechanical part of our life depends upon the moon and is subject to the moon. If we develop in ourselves consciousness and will and subject our mechanical life and all our mechanical manifestations to them, we shall escape from the power of the moon. So here in this passage, Kirchhoff is essentially saying what Dr. Sheldrake is saying in the morphic resonance theory, that these laws are actually habits and these habits are something that are deeply ingrained within our organism and within the universe itself. But by breaking these habits and uniting ourselves internally, we break ourselves from the influence of these outer forces influencing us with their habits. And here I'll give you one more quote from Gurdjieff to try to explain this. He says, Humanity, like the rest of organic life, exists on Earth for the needs and purposes of the Earth, and it is exactly as it should be for the Earth's requirements at the present time. Only thought as theoretical and as far removed from fact as modern European thought could have conceived the evolution of man to be possible apart from surrounding nature, or have regarded the evolution of man as a gradual conquest of nature. This is quite impossible. In living, in dying, in evolving, in degenerating, man equally serves the purposes of nature. Or rather, nature makes equal use, though perhaps for different purposes, the products of both evolution and degeneration. But at the same time, the possibilities of evolution exist, and they may be developed in separate individuals with the help of appropriate knowledge and methods. Such development can take place only in the interests of the man himself against the interests and forces of the planetary world. The man must understand this. His evolution is necessary only to himself. No one else is interested in it, and no one is obliged or intends to help them. On the contrary, the forces which oppose the evolution of large masses of humanity also oppose the evolution of individual men. A man must outwit them. This is the basis of the correct view of human evolution. There is no compulsory mechanical evolution. Evolution is the result of a conscious struggle. Nature does not need this evolution. It does not want it and struggles against it. Evolution can be necessary only to the man himself when he realizes his position, realizes the possibility of changing this position, realizing he has powers that he does not use, riches he does not see, and in the sense of gaining possession of these powers and riches, evolution is possible. So what Gurdjieff is saying here is that evolution happens on a planetary scale very slowly. And if you go any faster than the planetary scale of evolution, nature is actually fighting against you because it's only evolving at a certain very slow pace. But if you are able to break the habits of nature, if you're able to fight against them and struggle against the habits that have become ingrained in the psyche of humanity, then you have some chance to free yourself from those influences and gain a degree of free will and evolve to the next level of being. And one more similarity between Morphic Fields and Gurdjieff that I want to point out is the idea of telepathy. 
and telepathy can be explained by morphic fields. According to Dr. Sheldrake, telepathy and the sense of being stared at only seem paranormal if we define normal as the theory that the mind is somehow confined to the brain. But if our minds reach out beyond our brains and connect with other minds just as they seem to, then phenomena such as telepathy and the sense of being stared at seem normal. They are certainly normal in the sense that they are common. They are a part of our biological nature. Of course, I am not saying that the brain is irrelevant to our understanding of the mind. It is very relevant and recent advances in brain research have much to tell us. Our minds are centered in our bodies, in our brains in particular. However, they are not confined to our brains, but extend beyond them. This extension occurs through the fields of the mind that exist both within and beyond our brains. So here we have Dr. Sheldrake saying that telepathy is normal and it's because of these fields that are interconnected with our minds and are connected to other minds. And that's pretty similar to what Gurdjieff would say as well. And I'm going to quote something from Gurdjieff and he's talking about magnetism, hypnotism, and telepathy. Everything living has an atmosphere around itself. The difference lies only in its size. The larger the organism, the larger its atmosphere. In this respect, every organism can be compared to a factory. A factory has an atmosphere around it composed of smoke, steam, waste material, and certain mixtures which evaporate in the process of production. The value of these component parts varies. In exactly the same way, a human atmosphere is composed of different elements, and the atmosphere of different factories has a different smell, so has the atmosphere of different people. For a more sensitive nose, for instance, for a dog, it is impossible to confuse the atmosphere of one man with the atmosphere of another. I have also said that man is a station for transforming substances. Parts of the substances produced in the organism are used for the transformation of other matters, while other parts go into his atmosphere, that is, are lost. So here too, the same thing happens in a factory. Thus the organism works out not only for itself, but for something else. Men of knowledge know how to retain the fine matters in themselves and accumulate them. Only a large accumulation of these fine matters enables a second and lighter body to be formed within man. Ordinarily, however, the matters composing man's atmosphere are constantly used up and replaced by man's inner work. Man's atmosphere does not necessarily have the shape of a sphere. It is constantly changing its form. In times of strain, threat, or danger, it becomes stretched out in the direction of the strain. Then the opposite side becomes thinner. Man's atmosphere takes up a certain space. Within the limits of this space, it is attracted by the organism. But beyond a certain limit, particles of the atmosphere become torn off and return no more. This can happen if the atmosphere is greatly stretched out in one direction. The same happens when a man moves. Particles of his atmosphere become torn off and are left behind and produce a trail by which a man can be traced. These particles may quickly mix with the air and dissolve, but they also may stay in place for a fairly long time. Particles of atmosphere also settle on a man's clothes, underclothes, and other things that belong to him, so that a kind of track remains between them and the man. Magnetism, hypnotism, and telepathy are phenomena of the same order. The action of magnetism is direct. The action of hypnotism is at a short distance through the atmosphere. Telepathy is action at a greater distance. Telepathy is like the telephone or telegraph. In these, the connections are metal wires, but in telepathy, they are trails of the particles left by man. A man who has the gift of telepathy can fill this trail with his own matter and thus establish a connection, forming as it were a cable through which he can act on the man's mind. So overall, I think Gurdjieff would agree with Dr. Sheldrake's theory that telepathy isn't paranormal, it's just the way things work because of these fields that bind and connect us as humans. Also, according to Dr. Sheldrake, telepathy literally means distant feeling and typically involves the communication of needs, intentions, and distress. 
Sometimes the telepathic reactions are experienced as feelings, sometimes as visions and hearing of voices, sometimes in dreams. Many people and pets, when bonded, have recorded a certain type of reaction from a distance when a loved one dies. It's like they can just feel the energy of that person in fear or pain or feel that energy disappear through some type of telepathic image. Even if this is happening many miles away, there is an analogy for this process in quantum physics. If two particles have been part of the same quantum system and are separated in space, they retain a mysterious connectedness. When Einstein first realized this implication of quantum theory, he thought quantum a spooky action at a distance. Experiments have shown that quantum theory is right and Einstein wrong. A change in one separated part of a system can affect another instantaneously. This phenomenon is known as quantum non-locality or non-separability. Educated people have been brought up to believe that telepathy does not exist. Like other so-called psychic phenomena, it is conventionally dismissed as an illusion. There is a taboo against taking telepathy seriously, a taboo dating back at least as far as the Enlightenment at the end of the 18th century. And one last thing before we close, another similarity of the morphic resonance theory with Gurdjieff's theories. One of the hypothesized properties of morphic fields is that they have a spatial and temporal aspect and organize spatial temporal patterns of vibratory or rhythmic activity. So essentially there are these vibratory patterns that vibrate in similarity with other similar patterns. And they interrelate and coordinate the morphic units or holons that lie within them, which are in turn holes organized by morphic fields. Morphic fields contain other morphic fields within them in a nested hierarchy or holarchy. And this is very similar to what Gurdjieff would say as well. This is a quote from one of his books here. First of all, you must know that throughout the entire universe, every concentration to whatever species it belongs has the property of giving off radiations. Given that in man, the formation of the three totalities of functioning of his general psyche appear as an arising of results issuing from diverse sources, each of these sources must itself also have the property of giving off radiations. Just as the radiation of every cosmic concentration consists of vibrations emitted by a corresponding source, so too the vibrations issuing from the processes of each of these quite distinct totalities of functioning that make up the general psyche of man have a density and a degree of vivifyingness of their own. When there is contact between the radiations of different cosmic concentrations, blending of the vibrations takes place according to their affinity. Similarly, when the vibrations given off by two people come in contact, blending occurs among those of the vibrations that correspond to one another. So here Gurdjieff is saying essentially what is being hypothesized by Dr. Sheldrake in that you have these vibrations, they have a spatial and temporal aspect of organization containing different morphic units or holons that lie within them, which are holes organized by morphic fields. And Gurdjieff says here that each of these quite distinct totalities of functioning that make up the general psyche of man what he's saying is that these different totalities are the different centers within man, so the brain and the heart and the body, and they each have their own different vibrations that they're sending out and they're blending in with each other. And they also blend in with the vibrations of another human. And this is very similar to the different morphic fields and how there's a resonance with other morphic fields and how they will blend and 
become more similar. In conclusion, both Gurdjieff and Sheldrake in their respective teachings and theories invite us into a deeper realization of how intimately connected we are with the universe and with each other. This connectivity, this constant exchange of energy and influences and information underpins the very essence of our being and our potential for evolution. As we delve deeper into these concepts, it becomes clear that the potential for the individual and collective evolution is not just a possibility, but a responsibility. By consciously engaging with these energies, by choosing to align our actions, thoughts, and intentions with higher vibrational states, we not only liberate ourselves from the mechanical pulls of lower influences, but also contribute to the elevation of the collective consciousness. The journey towards awakening, towards individuation, and beyond is marked by the realization that we are not isolated beings. Our inner world is a mirror of the cosmic order, and our path to enlightenment is intrinsically linked to the evolution of the cosmos. The challenges, the struggles, and the obstacles we face in this journey are not mere hindrances, but are essential catalysts for growth, pushing us toward greater awareness, understanding, and unity with the universal mind. In summary, the teachings of Gurdjieff and the theory of morphic resonance presented by Dr. Sheldrake offer us a map and a method for navigating the complex web of existence. They remind us that we are a part of a vast living universe, each of us playing a critical role in its evolution. By understanding and integrating these insights into our lives, we unlock a door to a deeper connection with ourselves, with each other, and with the cosmos at large. This is the path to true freedom to the realization of our fullest potential and to the dawn of a new consciousness that transcends the limitations of our current understanding. Thank you for joining us on this exploration of Food for the Moon, the morphic resonance of Gurdjieff's teachings, and the infinite possibilities that await us as we embark on this journey towards awakening. Remember the permitic phrase, as above, so below. The universe is not just out there, it's within us, and through conscious effort we can align with its rhythms and vibrations and become co-creators of our destiny. We hope you've enjoyed this video and have a great day. Please like and subscribe. Thank you so much.